August 22nd. Our reading in the Old Testament today will be from the book of Job, chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll go through chapter 7, verse 21. Well, the three friends sincerely meant to console Job, but they ended up condemning him and taking Satan's place. Why? Well, because each of them saw Job's plight from his own narrow perspective and failed to identify with Job's perplexity and pain. Eliphaz asked Job why he did not practice what he preached. A fine way to start encouraging, you know, a hurting friend. May you and I never be this way to our friends in their time of trouble and need. This fellow Eliphaz told Job that sinners always reap what they sow, suggesting that it was Job's fault that he was now poor and sick instead of being rich and healthy. I mean, what encouragement is that? Then Eliphaz shared his so-called experience with God, on which he based his whole interpretation of life. Avoid those who make their experience the only test of truth. The Word of God does not change, but experiences do. We are all different, but God deals with each of us in ways suitable to our needs, our natures, and our level of maturity. Eliphaz closed his speech by telling Job to seek God and submit and to accept his correction. Then God would bless him again. But his suggestion played right into Satan's hands. Does Job fear God for nothing? Eliphaz had the same theology as the devil and didn't even know it. Listen, my friend, if you want to help others, listen with your heart as well as your ears. Try not to make your experience the only test of truth, because we all only know in part. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the Old Testament. August 22nd, Job chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 7, verse 21. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied to Job, Will you be patient and let me say a word? For who could keep from speaking out? In the past, you have encouraged many a troubled soul to trust in God. You have supported those who were weak. Your words have strengthened the fallen. You steadied those who wavered. But now, when trouble strikes, you faint and are broken. Does your reverence for God give you no confidence? Shouldn't you believe that God will care for those who are upright? Stop and think. Does the innocent person perish? When has the upright person been destroyed? My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. They perish by a breath from God. They vanish in a blast of His anger. Though they are fierce young lions, they will all be broken and destroyed. The fierce lion will starve, and the cubs of the lioness will be scattered. This truth was given me in secret, as though whispered in my ear. It came in a vision at night as others slept. Fear gripped me. I trembled and shook with terror. A spirit swept past my face. Its wind sent shivers up my spine. It stopped, but I couldn't see its shape. There was a form before my eyes, and a hushed voice said, Can a mortal be just and upright before God? Can a person be pure before the Creator? If God cannot trust His own angels, and has charged some of them with folly, how much less will He trust those made of clay? Their foundation is dust, and they are crushed as easily as moths. They are alive in the morning, but by evening they are dead, gone forever without a trace. Their tent collapses. They die in ignorance. You may cry for help, but no one listens. You may turn to the angels, but they give you no help. Surely resentment destroys the fool, and jealousy kills the simple. From my experience, I know that fools who turn from God may be successful for the moment, but then comes sudden disaster. Their children are abandoned far from help, with no one to defend them. Their harvests are stolen, and their wealth satisfies the thirst of many others, not themselves. But evil does not spring from the soil, and trouble does not sprout from the earth. People are born for trouble as predictably as sparks fly upward from a fire. 
My advice to you is this. Go to God and present your case to Him. For He does great works too marvelous to understand. He performs miracles without number. He gives rain for the earth. He sends water for the fields. He gives prosperity to the poor and humble. And He takes sufferers to safety. He frustrates the plans of the crafty, so their efforts will not succeed. He catches those who think they are wise in their own cleverness, so that their cunning schemes are thwarted. They grope in the daylight, as though they were blind. They see no better in the daytime than at night. He rescues the poor from the cutting words of the strong. He saves them from the clutches of the powerful. And so at last the poor have hope, and the fangs of the wicked are broken. But consider the joy of those corrected by God. Do not despise the chastening of the Almighty when you sin. For though He wounds, He also bandages. He strikes, but His hands also heal. He will rescue you again and again, so that no evil can touch you. He will save you from death in time of famine, from the power of the sword in time of war. You will be safe from slander and will have no fear of destruction when it comes. You will laugh at destruction and famine. Wild animals will not terrify you. You will be at peace with the stones of the field, and its wild animals will be at peace with you. You will know that your home is kept safe. When you visit your pastures, nothing will be missing. Your children will be many. Your descendants will be as plentiful as grass. You will live to a good old age. You will not be harvested until the proper time. We have found from experience that all this is true. Listen to my counsel and apply it to yourself. Then Job spoke again. If my sadness could be weighed and my troubles be put on the scales, they would be heavier than all of the sands of the sea. That is why I spoke so rashly. For the Almighty has struck me down with His arrows. He has sent His poisoned arrows deep within my spirit. All God's terrors are arrayed against me. Didn't I have a right to complain? Wild donkeys bray when they find no green grass, and oxen low when they have no food. People complain when there is no salt in their food, and how tasteless is the uncooked white of an egg. My appetite disappears when I look at it. I gag at the thought of eating it. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant my hope. I wish He would crush me. I wish He would reach out His hand and kill me. At least I can take comfort in this. Despite the pain, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. But I do not have the strength to endure. I do not have a goal that encourages me to carry on. Do I have strength as hard as stone? Is my body made of bronze? No, I am utterly helpless, without any chance of success. One should be kind to a fainting friend, but you have accused me without the slightest fear of the Almighty. My brother, you have proved as unreliable as a seasonal brook that overflows its banks in the spring, when it is swollen with ice and melting snow. But when the hot weather arrives, the water disappears. The brook vanishes in the heat. The caravans turn aside to be refreshed, but there is nothing there to drink, and so they perish in the desert. With high hopes, the caravans from Tima and from Sheba stop for water, but finding none, their hopes are dashed. You too have proved to be of no help. You have seen my calamity, and you are afraid. But why? Have I ever asked you for a gift? Have I begged you to use any of your wealth on my behalf? Have I ever asked you to rescue me from my enemies? Have I asked you to save me from ruthless people? All I want is a reasonable answer. Then I will keep quiet. Tell me, what have I done wrong? Honest words are painful. But what do your criticisms amount to? Do you think your words are convincing when you disregard my cry of desperation? You would even send an orphan into slavery or sell a friend. Look at me, would I lie to your face? Stop assuming my guilt, for I am righteous. Don't be so unjust. Do you think I am lying? 
Don't I know the difference between right and wrong? Is this not the struggle of all humanity? A person's life is long and hard, like that of a hired hand, like a worker who longs for the day to end, like a servant waiting to be paid. I, too, have been assigned months of futility, long and weary nights of misery. When I go to bed, I think, when will it be morning? But the night drags on, and I toss till dawn. My skin is filled with worms and scabs. My flesh breaks open, full of pus. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle flying back and forth. They end without hope. O oh God, remember that my life is but a breath, and I will never again experience pleasure. You see me now, but not for long. Your eyes will be on me, but I will be dead. Just as a cloud dissipates and vanishes, those who die will not come back. They are gone forever from their home, never to be seen again. I cannot keep from speaking. I must express my anguish. I must complain in my bitterness. Am I a sea monster that you place a guard on me? If I think, my bed will comfort me, and I will try to forget my misery with sleep. You shatter me with dreams. You terrify me with visions. I would rather die of strangulation then go on and on like this. I hate my life. I do not want to go on living. Oh, leave me alone for these few remaining days. What are mere mortals that you should make so much of us? For you examine us every morning and test us every moment. Why won't you leave me alone even for a moment? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O oh, watcher of all humanity? Why have you made me your target? Am I a burden to you? Why not just pardon my sin and take away my guilt? For soon I will lie down in the dust and die. When you look for me, I will be gone. August 22nd. Today, as we look into the New Testament, we'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. Verses 18 through 40. Why go to church? Well, God's people assemble for one purpose, that is to worship God. They worship Him by their praying and singing, uh, teaching and preaching. Worship should result in glory to God and blessing for God's people and fear and conviction for sinners who might be present. But for these things to happen, Jesus Christ must be Lord of our lives and we must yield to the Holy Spirit. If we come to church to display our spirituality, we'll not only miss the blessing ourselves, but also cause others to miss the blessing as well. See, we come to honor Him, not show ourselves off. A key word in this chapter is edification, which means building up. A worship service should lift up the Lord and build up the saints not puff up the participants. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the New Testament. August 22nd, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 18 through 40. I, Paul, thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in a church meeting, I would much rather speak five understandable words that will help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil. But be mature and wise in understanding matters of this kind. It is written in the Scriptures, I will speak to my own people through unknown languages and through the lips of foreigners. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting and hear everyone talking in an unknown language, they will think you are crazy. But if all of you are prophesying, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and they will be condemned by what you say. 
As they listen, their secret thoughts will be laid bare. And they will fall down on their knees and worship God, declaring, God is really here among you. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize what I am saying. When you meet, one will sing, another will teach. Another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in an unknown language, while another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must be useful to all and build them up in the Lord. No more than two or three should speak in an unknown language. They must speak one at a time, and someone must be ready to interpret what they are saying. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Let two or three prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can wait their turn. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the other churches. Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions to ask, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. Do you think that the knowledge of God's Word begins and ends with you Corinthians? Well, you are mistaken. If you claim to be a prophet, or think you are very spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord Himself. But if you do not recognize this, you will not be recognized. So, dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. Psalm 37, verses 30 through 40. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for Him. In Hebrew, be silent to God, and let Him mold thee. Keep still, and He will mold thee to the right shape. Trust the Lord to do that. Rest in the Lord. You know, restlessness is an evidence of unbelief. Faith rests in the Lord and enjoys the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. God sometimes waits in answering prayer so that He might strengthen our patience. We need to wait on the Lord. May I ask you, for what are you waiting? The inheritance God has for you. The wicked have only temporary pleasure on earth. But God's people have eternal treasure in heaven. You will one day receive your inheritance, so be patient. Psalm 37, verses 30 through 40. The godly offer good counsel. They know what is right from wrong. They fill their hearts with God's law, so they will never slip from His path. Those who are evil spy on the godly, waiting for an excuse to kill them. But the Lord will not let the wicked succeed, or let the godly be condemned when they are brought before the judge. Don't be impatient for the Lord to act. Travel steadily along His path. He will honor you, giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I myself have seen it happen, proud and evil people, thriving like mighty trees, but when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future lies before those who love peace. But the wicked will be destroyed. They have no future. The Lord saves the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in Him. Proverbs 21, verse 27. God loathes the sacrifice of an evil person, especially when it is brought with ulterior motives. <laughs>